Hello, Solid Rock Church. It is so good to be here uh, again, um, and thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, it's interesting because you guys have been praying on one side, and me and my wife have been praying on the other. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into everything, but, you know, there was a time that I had stepped down from um, a pastoral role down in White Plains, and, you know, I'm doing volunteer work now, but... Um, I was taking care of my mom, and uh, I stepped down to take care of her 24-7. And my mom is doing well now, and I felt the Lord call me back. And our prayer was where? Uh, it so happens that this, this, uh, um, this church was sent to me. Um, someone, uh, another pastor sent me a request that you guys were looking for a church. And I was like, where is Bolton Landing? And I had no clue. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, how far is it? I was like, wow, it's, it's three hours. And, um, you know, I talked to my wife, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know what's, you know, should I do it? I just see what happens. I sent the, I think I sent uh, my resume, right? And I, I think I sent a sermon, uh, a couple sermons, right? And I was like, we'll see. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm curious. And all of a sudden, you guys call back. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, hold on a second. So, this has been a journey, um, and like I said, we've been praying, and um, if this is God's will, this is God's will, and I know that God will bring us through this place, and um, we're going to reach Bolton Landing. It's all about Him, and um, I'm just happy to be here. Um, again, my name is Daniel Valentin. This is my family, Rebecca, Valentin, Galia, and Daniel, and uh we just love being here. We were enjoying our time in the hotel. We had what price choppers that we don't have that in White Plains at Yonkers, but uh, we went there. After we left here, we were like, "Hey, let's walk over there," and you know they, they do a good job. You know, blocking their stuff. It looks real neat. <laughs> so we had a good time. We bought donuts, and uh, yeah, we should not ate all that sweet stuff because then we had a crash. <laughs> but um. I'm going to actually, I'm excited today because I'm going to be uh, sharing one of my favorite Bible stories. Um, and it's a, a story that I enjoyed when I was little and, uh, and I still enjoy it now. And, um, but you know, every story in this book, we got to realize that this is the living word of God. And this book gives hope to the hopeless. He said his word when we read it and study it, it changes our perspective on life. If you look at the news, you can get down. But when you read this book and you know the God that you serve, our perspective completely changes. You know, I want to start with a, a short story. Um, and I feel like it'll drive my point about perspective. Um, it's a fable. Um, and it begins something like this. It says, a wolf left his lair one evening in fine spirits and an excellent appetite. As he ran, the setting sun ca uh, cast his shadow far out on the ground. And it looked as if the wolf were a hundred times bigger than he really was. Why, exclaimed the wolf proudly, see how big I am. Fancy me running away from a puny lion. I'll show him who's fit to be king, he or I. Just then, an immense shadow blotted him out entirely. I just lost my place. Oh, entirely. And then the next instant, a lion struck him down with a single blow. Church, Satan thought he had won. But Jesus. You see, the Lion of Judah struck him down with one single blow from the cross. He conquered death and rose on the third day so that you and I could have victory through him. You see, we must, uh, must approach every battle through the position of victory. Amen? Amen? See, we are in a spiritual battle, and in this battle, there is no middle ground. You're either on one side or the other. You see, there's no t room to compromise, and there is no time for retreat. See, we must stand our ground, for the fate of those around us are on the line. Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. 1 Corinthians 6.13 says, Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. 1 Peter 5.8 Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Brothers and sisters, we have an enemy that wants to destroy us. But it's important for us to know that our enemy is a defeated foe. And he is no match for our Savior. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord God, for your word, Lord God, that when we study and read your words, we see how great you are, Lord God. You are an awesome God. There is no match for you, Lord God. There is no problem too great for you, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord God. Lord, we look um, towards your words for, for the hope that we need in you, Lord God. Give us the strength. Give us the understanding, Lord God, that when we move out of this place, when we go to our separate ways, Lord God, that you may just lift us up, Lord God, that we may move boldly, Lord God, that we may be a reflection of your love, Lord God. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness, Lord God, and we give you all the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the title of this message is Perspective Matters, and this is a sermon that I preached a while back, but I really believe that it's something relevant for us today. And, and it just confirmed it when my brother uh, Merritt was talking. I was like, wow, this is like in line with everything that this sermon's about. So it's a famous story, like I said, in the Bible that most people are familiar with, where perspective mattered. See, in this story, there's a giant named Goliath, the Philistines champion from Gath. You see, uh, Gath was a, a known place for its giants. They say that Goliath was nine feet tall, and that's bigger than any, I think, any basketball player. I don't think there's any basketball player nine feet tall. To protect himself from blows to the body, he wore an elaborate tunic of fish-like bronze scales, which probably covered his arms all the way to his shins and most likely weighed about 125 pounds. He had a bronze shin guard protecting his legs, attached to bronze plate protecting his feet. He wore a bronze helmet. He had three separate weapons, all optimized for close combat. And he had a thrusting javelin made entirely of bronze, capable of penetrating a shield or armor. See, he, he wore a sword on his hip, and his, as his primary weapon, he had a short-range spear about 10 feet long with a 15-pound spearhead. See, this weapon was so accurate and deadly that it could pierce a shield and armor with one single blow. See, many scholars believe that Goliath weighed up to 15, I mean 500 pounds, and they say that he was strong enough to hold all that armor and his weaponry. So he wasn't a skinny guy. He was a strong man. See, imagine facing someone like that in battle. You see, that would be uh, intimidating I, for me. <laughs> but David didn't think so. You see, he had a different perspective. See, when facing your giant, perspective matters. So let's read. We're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit. So it's going to be um, verses 8 through 11. Then we're going to jump to verse 32 and then verses 40 to 47. So again, it's 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'll give you guys a moment to get there. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And this is mine, right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> huh? <laughs> All right. So, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8. Then he, Goliath, stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. 
And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and, and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 32. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine, with this Philistine. And in verse 40, Then he took David, he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five small stones from the brook, and put them in the shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling with his, with, was in his hand. And he drew near the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he, he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to uh, the Philistine, You come to me with sword, with spear, and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel." Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Blessed be the words of our Lord. See, at the Valley of Elah, Israel's future seemed to hang in the balance. And we see this in verses 1 through 3. See, the two armies assembled across from each other on opposite sides what appeared to be the Valley of Shadow of Death. You see, they reached a stalemate. Neither side wanted to leave the vantage point of the high ground and, and, and become vulnerable to attack. But one Philistine enters the no man's land to challenge Israel. See, in, in the days of Exodus, the people were reluctant to enter the promised lands because they heard of giants. And now they come face to face with a giant and they're terrified. You see, this is, the Israelites had to endure 40 days of Goliath taunting them. See, they were filled with fear. See, their king, Saul, was hiding in his tent, avoiding going out and facing um, Goliath because he saw an unconquerable enemy. See, David, however, he saw an uncircumcised Philistine who could be defeated. See, when facing your giant, perspective matters. See, this text highlights three important areas for every believer in order to defeat giants in your life. And the first is you must be willing to face your giant. The second is that you need to, we need to realize that the battle is the Lord's. And third, we must move forward in victory. So let's look at this first area, that we must be willing to face our giants. See, a giant is a problem or situation or a person in your life that appears so large that it intimidates you and causes um, you to live in fear. You see, you know that you are in a giant-sized problem, not merely by the mass of its size, but by the way it affects you. See, I want us to take a moment and notice what David saw as he looked and confronted Goliath. We see this in verses 4 through 7. This is what it says about Goliath. It says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And this could translate to nine feet six inches or nine feet nine inches. This man was humongous. See, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, 125 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, 15 pounds. 
And it says, then his shield bearer went before him. See, Goliath was a gigantic man. His appearance was beyond comprehension. He was the Philistines' perfect weapon. He was their tank. See, this text lets us know that Goliath wore all bronze that day. Picture the sun shining on his bronze, bronze armor and just blinding the Israelites. See, this was psychological warfare. Goliath wore it to play on the minds of Israel. He wanted to intimidate them before any fighting began. See, Goliath wanted to appear stronger and unbeatable. And he accomplished that task because Israel was so afraid of him. In the Babylonian um, Talmud, an ancient manuscript, it says this about Goliath. It says that he would, um, uh, he would come out to challenge them in, their, in the morning and evening. And this was the time that the Israelites were supposed to be praying, morning and evening, their prayer time. So he would distract them in their prayer time. Now, doesn't that sound familiar, what the enemy does to us? You see, he does not want us to be in prayer because when we seek the face of our Heavenly Father, our perspective changes. So according to verse 43, it says that Goliath cursed David by his gods. See, when David saw Goliath and heard what he was saying, he asked the question in verse 26, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, David uses the phrase uncircumcised Philistine to expose the fact that Goliath did not belong to the covenant people of Israel. Circumcision to the people of God was one of the constant reminders of the fact that God had made a covenant with them. It meant that they belonged to God. And Goliath being called uncircumcised Philistine meant that he opposed everything that God stood for. So we can vision in our minds that Goliath was an impressive man. He seemed unstoppable. He presented himself as someone who could not be beat. What kind of giant are you facing today? Does your giant seem unstoppable? Do you feel like there's no way that you can defeat something that you are facing at this moment? Before David could fight Goliath, he had to realize and recognize who and what he was facing. David had to confront his giant in his mind and his heart before he ever tried to attack him. See, Goliath had come into the actual territory of the Israelites. He had crossed their line. You see, it says in verses uh, 23 to 25 that the Goliaths began in the valley of Elah to challenge them. But then in verses 23 to 25, it says that he started going up. So he starts going up to them. You see, he was taunting them. And if we tolerate our giant, it will take our territory. It will come right up to your doorstep. This is why we don't run from giants. We don't negotiate with them. We attack them. See, when David looks upon this oversized Philistine, he is not impressed by Goliath's armor, his stature, or his curses. See, David sees a man and an army standing in defiance, not only of his people, but of the living God. See, David knows the Philistine army is subject to the power of God, and in faith he offers to face the giant in battle. Verses 38 through 39, we see that Saul is trying to clothe David with his armor. And eventually David refuses because, first off, he's not used to it. It doesn't fit him and he's not used to it. You see, you see, we can fight. We can't fight our giant with someone else's armor. David goes out to the brook. It says that he goes to pick up five stones and with his sling in his hand and he prepares himself to face Goliath. See, David used what he had. See, God has equipped you with everything you need to face your giant. And I believe that God has equipped Solid Rock Church for everything you need to fight the giants around here. Just with the little conversations that I had with several uh, of you, there's giants all over this place. And I believe we are here for such a time as this. Amen? Amen? 
For the Lord is what? The, the battle is the Lord's. Amen? So David walks away from Saul's conventional protective gear. See, Saul's armor has become a symbol of facing life through human means. We use Saul's armor when we trust our natural resources instead of divine enablement. See, the Bible tells us that as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. We see this in verse 48. As the enemy drew closer, David ran right at him. See, whatever your giant may be, force it into the light of day. Stop rationalizing it. Stop excusing it. Realize you can't defeat it on your own strength. Trust in the Lord. Don't look at God in the light of your giant. Instead, look at your giant in the light of God. Amen. See, when facing your giant, perspective matters. So we must be willing to face our giant. Second, we must realize that the battle is the Lord's. So I can see David as he listens to King Saul coming up with reasons why he shouldn't face and fight Goliath. See, David goes over victories he experienced while shepherding. He remembers how God gave him victory over the bear that tried to attack his sheep. He remembers how God gave him the victory over a lion that tried to um, um, attack his sheep. And this is in verse 34 to 36. See, while David was faithfully tending his sheep all alone, facing and defeating the bear and the lion, God was preparing him for Goliath. See, what is God preparing you for today? What has God been preparing you this last year? There's Goliaths out here. But God will give us the victory, amen? amen? See, David had nothing to fear in the present because of what God had did for him in his past. We should never forget what God has done for us in the past. As we look back over the circumstances and situations we, we, may, we have faced, we would discover that God was just preparing us to face the giants that are ahead of us. See, after Goliath spoke these threats, it says that David responded. He said in verse 45 to 47, he says, You come to me with sword, with spear, and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Remember this. If God gave you strength and victory in the past, he is able to give you strength and victory in your present situation. See, many times in life, we will face giants that seem impossible to conquer, but God promises in his word that we already have the victory in Christ. See, first, actually, faith does, doesn't always seem to be the best option. But the truth is that it's the only option that will bring true victory. 1 John 5, 4, it says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. See, David delivered the battle to someone else. He didn't look at Goliath and say, Hey, Goliath, this is between you and me. No, he said the battle is the Lord's. And I remember when I was in second grade, and you know that this affected me. This is second grade. I was a young kid, and I still remember this. Back in second grade, there was a kid. There was a giant. And uh, I always say this guy was like 30 years old. He was humongous. He wasn't really 30 years old, but he was a huge kid. And I remember he used to pick on me every single day. He would, um, he would throw me around. He would bother me. He would call me names. He would put me in headlocks and rub my head real hard. I was terrified of this kid. I remember I would think about him day in, day out. At nighttime, I would think about um, how I could avoid him 
the next day. And one day, you know, this guy got, got you know, he caught me. <laughs> I tried to avoid him. I mean, I was a paranoid kid. I was looking around. I was always on high alert. But one day, I have to say, he caught me probably slipping <laughs> because he got me. And I remember him throwing me around. I was all dirty. I, I would go home. And my sister, she comes to me, and um, she's like, you know, what's wrong? She says, uh, you know, why are you upset? And I told her. I was like, look, this guy has been picking on me. And, um, and I told her the situation. And my, my sister looked at me, and she was like, oh, okay. And that's it. And she walked away. And I was just like, oh, thank you, sis. Thanks for that, that touching conversation. You know, and she, she left me. So the next day, you know, I, I go to school, and I avoid this guy all day. And it was good because I didn't see him, and somehow I kept missing him. So, you know, the end of the day comes, and I feel so happy. I'm free. I'm like, look, I avoided this guy all day. So, you know, I went with my friends. I was happy. Let's go to the park. At that time, I lived on base housing, and the park was close to the school. So me and my friends go to the park. You know, I'm having a blast. I'm running around playing tag. You know what kids do. And all of a sudden, someone pushes me. And guess who it is? The 30-year-old. That's right. <laughs> Look back, and there he is looking at me. He began saying things to me. He was making fun of me. He was trying to egg me on so I could react. But this guy, I couldn't fight this guy. He was just too big, too strong for me. And I just, it was no way that that was going to happen. See, I felt helpless with this guy. I just remember um, him just calling me names, and I was just scared, and, 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 and I was just sitting there, like, paralyzed, like, what's going to happen? I'm thinking of my friends. I was like, man, this guy's going to pound me to the ground in front of my friends, and my friends weren't getting in it. All of a sudden, they vanished. I don't know. They were on the monkey bars looking around, but they left me. <laughs> so I remember this guy just saying things to me, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? But all of a sudden... I see my sister from the corner of my eye running full speed. See, my sister was a brawler back then. Let me tell you something about her. She sported a jerry curl, right? She carried a wooden brown brush, this huge brush. And for some reason back then, I don't know if they still do it now, all Hispanic families owned a big wooden brown brush. And my sister was a proud owner of one of them. So for, for some reason, she, you know, she's, she's running back. She, she's, she's running full speed. And I remember the sun just hitting her jerry curl. And it just shining on my face. And it felt like heaven doors just open. And I felt a peace in my heart. I was like, oh, Lord, I'm, I'm safe. And I remember just smiling at this bully. Remember, this guy, his size didn't change. He was still the big guy, the big bully that put me in a headlock. But things started changing in, in this whole area here now. So I'm just smiling at this guy. And I remember I just, you know, I stepped back. And this guy's still talking. And I remember my sister running full speed. That's all I hear. I just hear her steps. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing because... I step back, and I realized one thing. I step back because I knew that the fight was no longer mine. Amen. You see, because I added my sister to the equation. And all of a sudden, as this guy was saying all this mean stuff, I see an NFL tackle, perfect tackle. Boom, this guy falls on the floor. He gets up with bristle marks. He gets up crying snot on his face and my sister made that bully apologize to me and he walked away in tears let me tell you anyone that knew that she was my sister didn't bother me anymore they knew that I had someone on my corner <laughs> my sister scared this guy and let's just let's let me just share this my second grade year after that was smooth sailing 
It was peaceful. No one even gave me a bad... Somehow I made tons of friends because of my sister. You see, we need this mindset in the battles of life. We need to include our Heavenly Father. And then the battle belongs to Him. You see, we can sit back when we include God and just see what He does. See, David learned to see life from God's perspective. He knew that the Lord is the source, his source of deliverance. He knew what others did not. See, he seems unreceptive to danger and proclaims confidently in verse 47, it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. See, this should be our motto whenever we face opposition. On the surface, we may perceive Goliath as massive and David as insignificant, even naive, but that's because we're fixed on the outward appearance. See, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, The Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And I believe that the Lord is looking at the heart of this church. Solid Rock Church may seem like a small church here in Bolton Landing, but look at what God did with the small shepherd boy. I believe that God's placed us here for a reason. And I'm just excited to see what God's going to do in the future of this church. See, all the way through, the Bible teaches that the battle belongs to the Lord. See, when we are willing to follow him and uphold his cause and wait for him, he will be with us with power and wisdom to overcome the strongest enemies by the weakest means. See, David courageously went out to meet Goliath and told Goliath, this is the Lord's battle and he will give you to us. This is in verse 47. See, God brings giants, storms, and challenges not because he wants us to suffer for our sins, but so that we can grow in our character and in our faith. So we face enemy, enemy opposition to the truth of God's word. We endure personal attacks and we encounter spiritual warfare, but we overcome by resting in God's power. Philippians 4.13 reminds us, it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, when facing your giant, perspective matters. We need to keep the faith. See, at times, odds may be stacked up against us, and it may be overwhelming. But the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen? So we need to remember that, that we have to be willing to face our giants. We have to realize that the battle belongs to the Lord. And last, we need to move forward in victory. See, when it came time to act, there was no hesitation. David went at the, straight at the problem. See, giants don't go away. I mean, David's giant was there taunting them um, 40 straight days, day and night. Many of you know how that feels. You lose sleep. Anxiety builds. You're stressed. See, you are battling something that doesn't go away. See, giants don't give up. They don't go away. It will be there tomorrow, the next day, the next day, until we battle it. See, many times we get this kind of Christian submissiveness going on, and we get into the deal where we say, Lord, will you please deliver me from this thing that is beating me up? Will you please deliver me from this worry, this fear, this depression, this anger, this addiction, this action, this attitude? And then we don't do anything. But faith requires action. James 2.17 lets us know, it says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith is trust in action. Trust God to deliver you. Trust him to show up and do something. Run at the problem. Engage it. But it's important for us to understand, David stood up and said, the battle is the Lord's, but it was David who swung the sling. 
It was David who picked up the stones. The battle is the Lord's, but he calls us to do the fighting. And we are fighting for important things. We are fighting to free ourselves from the sins that easily ensnare us. We are fighting for the transformation of our souls. Your giant is not going away until you fight it. See, the battle is the Lord's, but, our gi- but it's our giant. And we are called to fight our own battle. Philippians 2.12 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. See, the battle is the Lord's. See, King Saul was one of the biggest guys in Israel. It says that he stood head taller than anyone in Israel. So the question is, why didn't Saul fight Goliath? See, Saul was scared of Goliath because the Bible tells us that he drifted from God. See, the further you are from God, the bigger your Goliath is going to look. Your distance from God will make your giant bigger, bigger looking or smaller looking. See, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 4, 18. See, the more your love relationship is intact with your heavenly father, the less likely you will be shook up when you face your giant. So are we engaging in the fight? Are we doing whatever we need to do? To win the battle. See, the battle is the Lord's. But you are the one he wants to swing that sling. Psalms 23 was written by David. And we see in verses 1 through 4, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. And I just think of David in the valley of Elah, facing Goliath, death right there. But you see, David doesn't stop the Psalms there. He goes on and he says, he says, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, David was a shepherd and he knew what he did as a shepherd, protecting his sheep from the bear and the lion. How much more would God protect his own? The good shepherd. So you may be in a fight today, and I want you to know that God is fighting alongside you, and you might be down right now, but the battle is the Lord's, and you keep swinging. You keep battling. Don't give up. See, some things are worth fighting for, and your faith, your family, your freedom is worth the battle. It's worth the fight. See, David's victory mobilized the Israeli army, and they were blessed. See, others are watching how you face your giants. When you allow God to give you victory over your giant, others will be encouraged and blessed. Verse 51 says this, it says, Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. See, David took the very thing the enemy was threatening him with, this sword, and he used it to cut the enemy's head off. See, that's what, that's what we do to the enemy with the things that he tried to destroy us with. We are flipping it around, and it becomes a testimony of God's deliverance. Each one of us has a story. Each one of us has a testimony of where God has brought you out of. We share that story. It encourages people to see what you've done to your past giants. And it also encourages you too. When you remember, when you're facing your current giant, remember what God did for you in the past. See, the battle is the Lord's, but we need to move forward in victory. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know all all that, I mean, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. See, David is an example that when one life is yielded to the Lord, it will make a huge difference in many lives. The same thing that happened to David can happen to us today. 
See, we can face, fight, and finish off our giant if we will trust and depend on the Lord. Don't just throw your stone at Goliath and hit him on the forehead. No. Go over to your giant. Take the sword and cut its head off and completely finish it. Don't give that giant that you are facing in your life the opportunity to live again in your life. I believe one of the biggest highlights of this story is a challenge of single combat, which was a common practice in ancient warfare, which would actually protect of much bloodshed. Pretty much both armies would choose a champion and they would go down and they would be one on one fight. Winner takes all. See, Jesus died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, rose from the grave three days later, defeating Satan and all the forces of hell. See, Adam's sin wasn't inherited to the whole race. But Jesus, you are not going to heaven because you want. You are going to heaven because he won, and it just got credited to you and I. So the question for all of us today is, will we move forward in victory? It makes no difference what you are facing. It makes no difference what your giant may be. You can defeat any giant that comes your way. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. See, when facing your giant, perspective matters, church. See, I want to close with a story. Something that happened a while back, May 24th, 2012. I remember me and my wife, my wife is pregnant at the time, and we went um, to an appointment to see our child, you know, uh, in her belly and stuff. And um, we were excited. This was our second child. So it was an excitement that we had until the doctor walked into the office. And I remember this doctor started speaking to us, and he said, this child looks like it's going to have medical complications. So um, he was telling us, he was like, look, I want to do a test on, on your baby. However, there was a risk in the sense of this test would, could actually hurt my child. But the doctor said, look, it's important um, that we do this test because um, it gives you the choice if you want to keep the child or abort. So me and my wife were like, that's not an option. We're going to keep our child regardless of complication. So we refused the test. And, and, and we left the office. I remember that day that my wife, there was tears in my wife's eyes. We went to the car, and she was crying. And I remember, like, I was trying to console her, but inside I was hurting as well. But I tried my best. And um, she, had, she had to go to the motor vehicle to renew her license, and I remember dropping her off, and I went to look for parking. And, you know, after I parked the vehicle, that's when it really hit me, and I broke down in the car. And as I was crying, I received a phone call. And, you know, it was my father. He, he was calling me. And, uh, you know, God is always on time, isn't he? <laughs> always on time. So my father calls me, and I pick up the phone, and I start telling him exactly what happened. And I shared with him, and my father encouraged me. And uh, he encouraged me with these words that I'm going I'm to share a few of them. I actually wrote down what he told me in my phone, and I dated it so that I would always have it, and I could always look back on it. So I'm going to share what my dad told me. He said, remember the one that you serve is in charge. The enemy is out to take your joy. Trust in God and know he is in control. Keep your eyes on God. Be joyful in your heart. He has blessed you with another child. Lift up your eyes to the Lord. Thank God for everything. The enemy could attack the flesh but not the spirit. After talking with my father, my perspective changed. I realized that my God was bigger than whatever the doctor said. Amen. Let me tell you, my son is healthy. He's a healthy boy and he's here. You guys seen him with your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 
He takes after his dad. <laughs> you see, God has the last word. I believe we can be like the Israelites at times and forget the one that we serve is in charge. The giants in our lives will try to steal our joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we need to lift up our eyes to the Lord. Psalms 121 verses 1 through 3 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. If you're facing a giant in your life, the only thing you can do is put your faith in the God that could do all things. Don't look at your giant from an earthly perspective. Look at it from heaven's perspective. God is bigger and a giant than, than any, any giant that you will ever face. When facing your giant, church, perspective matters. We must remember, we must be willing to face our giant. Realize that the battle is the Lord, and we must move forward in victory. Amen? Let us pray. If you could just bow your heads with me. I just want to pray with you. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I come before you thanking you. You are an awesome God. You are the God of heaven and earth, Lord God. You are the creator, Lord. Father, you are bigger than anything, Lord God, that we may be facing, Lord. And right now, I just lift up everyone who is present, Father, Lord God. I pray that you may just increase their faith, Lord God, that they could depend on you for all things, Lord God, that they can just start seeing you move in their life, Lord, that you may just remind them of where you brought them from, Lord God. Increase their faith, Lord God. Strengthen them, Lord God. Let them be a reflection of your love wherever they go. Even when they go to the grocery store, that the cashier may come in contact with you through their life, Father, Lord God. Father, Lord, I pray that every giant that they face may seem small to them, Lord God, because they know whom they serve, Lord God. Give them the strength. Protect their homes. Protect their families, Lord God. And I just want to give an opportunity. If there's anyone here that maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Again, I, I said this last time I here. I don't know everyone's heart. Only God does. But I want to give that opportunity. If there's anyone here that may not have a relationship with Jesus, I just want to give you the opportunity to come. Come before Jesus. He wants a relationship with you. If there's anyone here, if you could just slip your hand up, and I just want to pray with you. I see you, brother. Is there anyone else? Praise God. Your heads bowed. Just keep praying. If I could ask my brother to just come down here. I just want to pray with you, brother.